Um, again, this is Deanna Toledo. I am the Leadership Development Director for River Network, and I serve as one of the coordinators for the Urban Waters Learning Network, along with Anne-Marie Mitroff. You've probably seen Anne-Marie's name with Groundwork USA. You are joining the Turning Vacant Lots into Green Spaces, Baltimore Experience. Thank you so much for making the time to hear about what we think is a very exciting project and one that we would love to see um, inspire other cities around the country to follow suit. Um, Baltimore really is leading the charge on this front. Um, and uh, just looking forward to, uh, to our presenters here. We've got Mike Galvin, who is the ambassador for the Baltimore Urban Waters Partnership. We've got Morgan Grove, who is a team leader with the field station, the US Forest Service Baltimore Field Station. And we also have Seema Iyer, um, who is associate director of the Jacob France Institute, which houses the, um, or coordinates the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance another really exciting project, part of a national network that you'll get to hear more about. So before we dive right into um, the, the Baltimore project itself, for those of you who are new here, I just want to introduce you to the Urban Waters Learning Network, which is an EPA-funded project that brings together our urban waters practitioners, many of them grantees of the EPA Urban Water Small Grants Program. Um, all of the Urban Waters Federal Partnership locations. I think there's, there's 19 or 20 of those today. Um, and it really is a peer network for people and for organizations that are working on urban waterways, either focused on the waterways themselves or, or supporting the communities that surround them. And the whole effort of the Learning Network is to really strengthen your effectiveness by bringing you examples, um, of good work being done elsewhere in the country around urban waters by giving you a platform to share your own experiences, to learn and, and share, gain skills, et cetera. So um, it's an excellent network. It's growing. Uh, if you'd like more information and are not already engaged with us, I encourage you to turn to urbanwaterslearningnetwork.org and you can learn more about it. Um, one thing that I want to plug just really quickly we don't only work as a virtual network. Every year we meet face-to-face -face as part of River Rally, a national conference that uh, we host, the premier river conservation conference for the, for the grassroots community. Um, that is scheduled for May in Mobile, Alabama. And on that Friday, it's a three, it rally is a three-day event, but on that Friday, May 20th, we are going to have, again this year, our face-to-face -face meeting of the Learning Network. So I want to encourage you to look into that. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Rally registration just opened, I think, uh, like three days ago. So um, you'll be hearing more about it on Basecamp, how to, how to apply for a scholarship, how to, how to register. Um, but if you're not on Basecamp and in the Learning Network, you can um, let me know if you have any questions or go directly to rivernetwork.org. So hopefully we'll get to see a lot of folks there and do exactly the kind of exchanges we facilitate through webinars but in person, which end up being a much richer experience. So um, with that, I want to turn it to our presenters and introduce them. We've got Mike Galvin, and I, and I will say our presenters all have about three or four different uh, titles, so I just kind of picked from a few. Um, Mike Galvin is the ambassador for the Baltimore Urban Waters Federal Partnership. He is also with Save a Tree, a consulting group there in Baltimore. Um, we're going to hear from him and from Morgan together. They're going to co-present. Co um, Morgan Grove, again, with the Baltimore Field Station, a U.S. Forest Service field station. And finally, we're going to hear from Seema Iyer from the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it to Mike and to Morgan. If you just give me a second, I'll pull up your slide. Um, and I think we're set. Go ahead. Thanks very much, Diana, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to share with you. We're going to be talking today about the Green Padded Book and Registry, Turning Waste into Assets in the Sustainable City. And these uh, things that we're going to talk about are both outcomes of the Baltimore Urban Waters Partnership. I imagine that all of you being part of the EPA Urban Waters Learning Network are familiar with the 
national partnership in the various locations across the country, and we happen to work in the one in Baltimore, Maryland, in the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, to talk about how these two pieces fit into the framework of what we do, uh, Morgan is going to explain uh, that to us in our overall framework. Thank you, Mike. This is an image of, of the overall structure for Baltimore Urban Waters Partnership. And there are four key components within this framework, one of which is the Green Pattern Book, which we'll be talking. And the Green Pattern Book has been a, a sort of signature effort for Baltimore Urban Waters. And it provides the basis by which to inform uh, local projects that we can do through uh, the Baltimore Urban Waters. It also connects to the mapping, which uh, is becoming rebranded as the Green Pattern Registry. And, and SEMA will be talking about that. And then the other piece that we have is models and monitoring, which is the monitoring evaluation research component of the Baltimore Urban Waters. And, and it's important to note that we have these four different efforts, as well as to, to recognize the linkages among them, and that they are mutually beneficial and they inform each other. And within, uh, within this overall effort for Baltimore Urban Waters, um, we also focus on outreach, education, adaptive management, and, and workforce development. So we have these four key components, and then they, they exist within this larger context of, of how we try to work. But we wanted to signal uh, this overall structure to you so you have an understanding or, or a picture of the two different components that we're going to talk about, how they, they fit into the Baltimore Urban Waters. With that, I'll, I'll hand it back over to you, Mike. So this is the key issue that we're trying to address in the Baltimore Urban Waters Partnership. Uh, we feel like this is the triple bottom line issue in Baltimore. If we can figure this out, what to do with these 30,000 vacant and abandoned lots, there are about 14,000 vacant lots and about 16,000 abandoned properties. So about half of these have no structure on them, and about half of them have abandoned derelict structures on them. But 30,000 is a lot, and we feel Again, when we're trying to uh, help Baltimore address the triple bottom line of people, planet, and prosperity, we think uh, if we can solve this and turn this uh, vacant into value, we'll help all three of those. We'll help the economy, we'll help the environment, and we'll help the economy. Uh, one thing we've learned from the Chesapeake Bay program, the Chesapeake Bay program, uh, that is the large body of water near us that Baltimore Harbor eventually ends up in. And the Chesapeake Bay program is considered a premier estuary restoration program around the world. And it's fairly unique in that it's a very large body of water. About six states uh, are, have pot are all in the Chesapeake Bay. And they drain into a very small body of water. And one thing we've learned from that experience is that the land can make the water sick. When you have runoff running across, land that has various pollutants on it and various chemicals, it can create water quality problems. So uh, even though this may not seem on the surface of it to have a direct tie to the urban waters of Baltimore City, we believe that it certainly does. The, the city is actually working on a number of different kinds of initiatives that um, to try to address this. The, there are two major uh, mayoral initiatives that uh, are, are part of this. One is the vacancy values, which uh, tie into the, the vacant lots and the, the vacant homes that Mike was talking about. And then there's also the growing green initiative. So th these two things tie together in terms of how do we um, start to take these uh, lands, how do we reclaim them, and then how do we turn them into to things that are productive? And then we also need to think about uh, how it enhances the overall desirability of the city and, and trying to get people to both stay, to not move out, and also to attract new people to, to move into the city. And so the city's developed 
the housing market typology, which intersects with the these different types of mayoral initiatives of dealing with the vacant lands and, and the vacant homes. And, and ultimately, our goal is to take these uh, to work in these neighborhoods uh, where the housing market is, has been classified as distressed and to uh, advance them so that they are much more desirable places to live. And, and so within that, it gets back to Mike's triple bottom line about how can we do this to enhance both the, the, the people, uh, the places, and the prosperity of these neighborhoods. Which brings us to the Green Pattern Book. Uh, the Green Pattern Book is uh, available online. It's free uh, as a US Forest Service publication. It was conceptualized initially at the Baltimore Field Station of the Northern Research Station of the Forest Service. And it was developed under a grant from the US Forest Service Northern Research Station to the Baltimore Office of Sustainability. So, uh, we had kind of an idea, talked about it with our local partners, and fleshed out the idea with their concurrence and assistance, and then gave them a grant to kind of take that concept. And it was a very amorphous concept at the beginning, but they did a great job of connecting to the various agencies and NGOs and stakeholders in the city, having a series of charrettes saying, should this be a web tool, should this be a book? What should it look like? What kind of information should it have? Because we wanted it to be uh, very much a toolkit, not an abstraction, and that something when partners got it in their hands, they'd be able to use it, uh, whether it was an agency, an NGO, a neighborhood group, or an individual citizen. So uh, these were all done, uh, again, under the uh, Baltimore Urban Waters Partnership and uh, our two primary partners there, but there were many, many more partners involved other than the two uh, primary ones that we note here. What we have here is, is illustrations of the different kinds of abandonment that, that we witnessed, um, and, and they all have their kind of social and economic history. Um, the, the Swiss cheese, um, is, is where you, you start to lose a lot of buildings. Uh, we have the missing tooth, or what we call the hockey player look. And, and, and I should remind folks that Baltimore is an old, uh, in a sense, colonial city, and, it's, and, and that you have this, all these uh, row houses. And so you have, it's not, we have, it's, very un, it's not like Detroit and other kinds of cities of the Midwest, where you have, um, larger lot sizes and larger homes. In Baltimore, it's, it's much more dense, um, and you have a, a lot of connected housing. And we see these corner lots where you lose the, uh, the first row house uh, on the corners, which had typically been where you'd have a small business, you'd have a bakery, you'd have a group of like, well, small grocers or other kinds of business, you, and people would live above it. That's the, the corner lots, which often were the first that would be lost. Um, through vacancy, you have the missing tooth or hockey player look where we start to lose numerous uh, row homes, but it's not continuous. Then we get to Swiss cheese where we're losing lots of, um, lo lots of row homes. We also have a situation where we have the inner blocks. And so what you would have is the uh, larger homes on the outer part of the block, and then you would have what we call alley houses um, that would be with in the inner parts. And that would often be associated with where you had servants or slaves living, um, given the, the, the old history of the city. And those, because they were of poor quality and smaller, those were often some of the homes that were first to be lost. But then you could have other kinds of uh, lots where it wasn't housing, but other kinds of industries, such as the remnants, or we have half box, or we've lost the entire full block. And so what we, what we started with the Green Pattern Book and going back to those vacants to values and the Growing Green Initiative was to look at the different kinds of um, spatial patterns and structure that you, you could have um, as we, we start to take back uh, these, these blocks. 
and and it, we have to be sensitive to the different kinds of scenarios that we would be uh, addressing. So realizing that we have these temporal considerations about when we think the properties are going to be de redeveloped according to the housing market typology, and then we have this issue of the fact that when people vacate and abandon their properties, they go to it strategically, and a row house is really like one big house that's a bunch of little houses connected to it. Uh, it creates some unique considerations. So uh, based on those considerations, we developed these eight green patterns, these eight typologies. Uh, clean and green, which is a short-term kind of a stabilization. It's just, you know, put grass down, plant a tree or two, put a fence around it, show occupancy, pick up the trash. But that's really uh, when we think something is going to be redeveloped in a fairly short-term. Urban agriculture, uh, which of course is, is growing. Community managed open space, and this can be a variety. Of, uh, of, of uses, as you see here, vegetable gardens, orchards, pocket parks, uh, horticultural growing, small recreational spaces. This is basically situations where uh, adjoining neighbors say, I live near that, I look at it every day, I'm sick of looking at it like it is, I'm going to go and do an intervention and do something about it. Stormwater management is trying to take some of these properties and uh, adapt them so they can help with stormwater compliance. And because stormwater management involves engineering and often gray infrastructure and costs, that type of intervention would only be done normally on lots that we don't think are going to be desirable in the market for quite some time. A green parking is just like it sounds. We put some stormwater management uh, in a parking facility and make those uh, coexist together because parking is a premium issue in the city and is one of the great uh, obstructions and controversies to do in any kind of retrofit. Uh, urban forests and buffers, uh, streamside forests, uh, groups of trees, uh, neighborhood parks, of course, uh, just they sound like. And the final one, mixed greens, is any combination of the seven above and we certainly try to uh, make these things not uh, one purpose but multi-purpose when we can. So often these types of uses will interact with each other. With the Green Pattern Book, it, it's more than uh, just trying to have those patterns in design. It, it's trying to provide guidance to as Mike mentioned, uh, the various public agencies, the NGOs, to community groups, private individuals, businesses, about how to use, uh, select sites, what are the leases and permits that are going to be required, um, how do you lay out uh, the design and, and implementation, what are the maintenances, maintenance requirements that you're going to have, what are the resources, and what are examples of, of local success. And so the book goes through all each all those components uh, for each of the different types of, of patterns. And uh, one of the things that I think has been really interesting is that we have, it's, it's been a continual community engagement process where working with a variety of different partners, they helped us to uh, develop the, the, the list of uh, patterns, the technology, and then they identify what were the key pieces that we needed for the toolkit and, and coming up with this list. And then all contributing their information um, about each of these different pieces and volunteering you know, that they're available as a resource or telling their success story um, or identifying uh, what's the process for, for how you go about leases and permits. So it's been a, it's been a very interesting engagement process. And, and because we, we had our local partners involved, it, it gives some, we feel pretty good about and confident about uh, that we've developed something that, that's going to be useful. So with that, we want to talk about some of the outcomes that we have, because I think that's uh, one of the things we believe that you're interested in. One of the great outcomes from this was 
something called a Growing Green Design Competition. As Morgan said, we continually have these feedback loops, and one of them was when we were pretty much done with the book. We thought it was good, but we weren't sure if we knew it would work. So we wanted to do a field test. And as we discussed this in the Baltimore Urban Waters Partnership, our friends at EPA Region 3 said, you know, we really think this is a great idea. We'd like to support it. Uh, if you can find a way that you can think of us supporting it that makes sense, uh, we'll try to put something together. So what ended up happening was uh, EPA offered up $100,000 and Baltimore City offered up $200,000 to have a $300,000 design competition that was administered by the Chesapeake Bay Trust, which is a uh, grant-making entity created by state legislation in Maryland. So uh, Chesapeake Bay Trust administered the process. It had a couple of unique considerations. One of them was that each of the design teams had to have members of the community and design professionals on it. And I understand that is a unique requirement among design competitions uh, nationally. And the reasons for that were the following, that they didn't want community members to come up with some grandiose vision that was unconstructible and unaffordable and they didn't want design professionals coming up with some grandiose vision that nobody who were, was in the neighborhood wanted to live next to. <laughs> so by putting these people together, they could get, find out what the community wanted and then have professionals help implement that vision into a plan that was constructible. So we think it was a pretty good process and pretty exciting. Here's some examples of the different uh, winners for the the design competition. We have the um, and, and it involved a, a real huge variety of different kinds of um, partnerships and NGOs that were involved with the from the the Peace Park that, that we had up at associated with George Heights uh, Community Development Corporation to uh, another project that involved um, a green parking lot, and then we also have another one that's a, a flower factory where the production of flowers uh, for sale uh, to more reflective places where we're trying to create uh, amenities that do stormwater management, but amenities that create places for people to uh, gather and uh, a place to rest and, and um, solitude. The, one of the interesting things of this is that it ended up also being uh, a test of the Green Pattern Book in terms of how well it worked and, and do we have all the information uh, needed. And then also um, it's been a great test for the city to look at what are their processes, particularly as it relates to permitting and leasing and how easy is it for these projects to move through the system and, and to get installed. And, and because we had the city, uh, the city's been involved through the entire process and has been a sponsor of this, it, it's been really critical to um, instigating, provoking, promoting uh, the city to make changes so that these things uh, are more easily done. And, that, and that's been a, a really neat piece to the Green Pattern Book is that it's been tied to um, or I guess it, from the community engagement process of the beginning to actually starting to implement it and, and constantly looking at how we can improve it uh, and, and think of it as sort of a living kind of activity and document. Something that was very exciting that uh, happened very recently about a week ago is there was an announcement by Mayor Rawlins Blake and Governor Hogan that they were collaborating on a plan to invest $700 million to demolish and or deconstruct about 4,000 of these abandoned row homes in West Baltimore in the area where the unrest occurred in, in 2015. And initially, uh, these deconstructed and demolished buildings are going to be turned into greening, and some of these green spaces are going to be 
envisioned as community green spaces in the green pattern, as in the green pattern book. Some of them are going to be clean and green, and they're going to be stabilized for short-term purposes with the intention of uh, a lot of this funding supporting some redevelopment of more uh, modern quality housing in the community. So uh, that's a great outcome, but we were really excited to see that the green pattern book was a part of this plan. I apologize. Our, we have lost our slides temporarily. Let me let me see if I can't get them back up. I'm not sure what happened. Okay. There's well, while you're doing that, why don't why don't we handle some of the questions? Yeah. So one of the questions is, is how is the book being? Dis we have an, an initial product run of of 700 of these books. Uh, we're we're holding on to some of them uh, in the in the Baltimore Forest Service office. Uh, so that when we get requests for the distribution of the book, we can we can mail the folks. We gave uh, we provide a uh, uh, hundred or 150 of the copies to the Department of Planning so that they can distribute through their activities. Then we we provided a, a large balance of the books to the, the Parks and People Foundation, who through through support from the city run a small grants program uh, for doing these kinds of projects. And uh, for people who are interested in making an application when they contact Parks and People, Parks and People then sends them uh, one of these books so that they can use the book as a basis for, for making their proposals. We've also uh, distributed to all the other uh, NGOs um, that do this kind of work in the city, and, and we've given them more than one. We've given them you know, enough so that they can distribute them as well, uh, and then and then the book is available online, uh, so that it can be downloaded and printed too. So we're we're trying to figure out like what's the most effective and strategic ways to to distribute it, both in, in hard copy and and digitally, um, and then also making folks aware through networks like this of the availability of the book, so that it could be in a sense repurposed to to other city situations. Um, one of the things, uh, if I may jump back to slides then, the, the thing that we're um, going to with Baltimore Urban Waters and the Green Pattern Book, the, the next progression is that the city is starting to look at uh, how do we build a green network that, uh, based upon the Green Pattern Book and addressing these vacant lots, what you see is a, the current situation of, of green uh, on the on the right hand side is showing where most of those vacant lots and vacant homes are, and the the city has put out a request for proposals um, for firms to work work with them to develop a master plan for this green network that would address with particular attention these vacant lots and and soon to be vacant lots where we have vacant homes and tying it into the existing green assets of the city, whether it's on public land or institutional land. And part of what they'll be doing through this process, I think, addresses one of the other questions, which is looking to um, develop strategies for prioritization about what kinds of things to, which of the green patterns to install in different places um, that, that work with the communities uh, at the same time, because these things have to be acceptable and desirable for the, for the communities to, to want to have. So that, that's something that the city will be working on um, over the next nine months to a year, developing that master plan and, and the communication strategies for it. And then will be a, a follow-up phase of, of how, we, how that starts to get uh, installed. And with that, and Mike is texting me that we need to wrap up so that we don't cut into Seamus time. Um, is that the last slide, Mike? That is the last slide. OK. Uh, if, I think we have a couple of minutes. If I can raise, uh, Catherine posted a question of how did you begin, the, how did you conduct the inventorying process? And when you were um, determining possible green uses for lots, was that automated or done manually? Well, the, the, the inventorying of these lots is, 
is part of a t uh, tax process. Um, and and it's part of the property record system that the city has. Um, so that, that's just a basic piece of the data infrastructure of, of the city. In terms of prioritization or figuring out what to do with these lots, to, to date it has been mostly a bottom-up process. Um, and it, it works through the Growing Green Initiative and, and with the Department of Planning and Housing and Community Development. The Green Network Initiative is going to be taking a um, is going to be more of this is it, going to be more oriented towards this prioritization and which patterns fit where uh, with more of a what I would call bird's eye view um, and then connecting with the with the communities. So um, th this next phase is going to be uh, a more strategic. Uh, view of, of how to uh, advance various types of initiatives. And, and part of the requirements through this process is to develop what are the criteria for prioritization and developing prioritization tools that will be a really neat outcome of that initiative. Mm -hmm. Great. Another question is, would you, I'm a, I, Jennifer from EPA writes in, would you be open to working with a community that's using your green pattern book? I'm assuming a, a community outside of Baltimore that might be using yours as a guide, perhaps to develop their own or, or similar project? Well, there's, there's a saying in, 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 in architecture that good ideas are borrowed and great ideas are stolen. Um, to the extent that other communities want to steal, steal this, uh, we would take that as an indication that we developed something pretty good. You know, certainly, I think that the work that we've done in Baltimore, uh, we, we developed it to be used in Baltimore, but we also developed it with the hope that other cities would use it. And we would, I think, take it as a compliment uh, that that other cities decided to, to, to adopt this and just take out Baltimore, put in Cleveland, whatever it is uh, that needs to be done. But yeah, we, we think it'd be great. We, we don't feel proprietary in that it's ours and we're not going to share. Uh, the attitude we have. Right. And it's certainly not something that a federal agency would support either. So we, we, it was always under the guise that other cities could, would hopefully use it. Right. All right. Well, I know we have a couple of other questions there on the chat box. I'll, I'll encourage Mike and Morgan if you could take a look um, and maybe answer them via the chat box while we turn things over to um, thank you so much for your presentation, everybody. I, I, I'm aware that this is it's a complicated process that they used in this in this uh, project. Very exciting, and there's a lot more to share. Um, we just wanted to kind of give you a flavor. You have Morgan and Mike's uh, email addresses right here, um, and we'll be able to we'll send that those out as well following the webinar, along with the with a link to the recording, so you can get in touch with them for more questions. Um, it is, as you can imagine, a project of this scale has a significant component. And so that's where um, SEMA's organization, the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance, uh, through the Jacob Franz Institute comes in. Um, and let me just turn it to you, SEMA, and tell us a little bit about what's happening on the back end and the mapping uh, related to this project. OK, thank you so much. And uh, always great to follow Mike and Morgan. Um, so. Let me tell you a little bit about our organization first, because um, the Urban Waters Partnership in Baltimore, one of the best things about it is that it has brought together um, a collaboration across sectors that may not have otherwise had that convening factor uh, without that partnership. And so the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance is um, an organization that works with community organizations and works with neighborhoods to follow and track quality of life measures. And before the partnership was announced in Baltimore, we had independently realized that communities really care about their water quality. And they don't generally get too much information about um, you know, what's going on in an aggregated way in their neighborhood. And that's our mission, is to try and get them information. And so it was a very serendipitous moment where we were ready to start doing this kind of work, and the partnership was also created, and you know we could kind of marry each other's expertise. So um, 
background on what we do and who we are, which hopefully will be of use no matter what city you're in. We are the Baltimore partner for the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership, which is loosely organized by the Urban Institute and consists of 36 cities around the country, typically of a similar kind of distressed, weak market city like Baltimore happens to be, where tracking neighborhood quality of life on an annual basis uh, became critical, particularly in the face of rapid population decline, like a city like Baltimore has experienced. So the basic goal is that there's so much information that existed in city agencies uh, that they had been collecting for administrative purposes, but weren't getting in the hands of communities. And so in the 1990s, there was a movement. Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance was among some of the early cities that adopted this kind of view, that if we pull all this data from city agencies, integrate it, and put it out in the hands of communities, we would essentially be kind of democratizing the data, democratizing the information, and helping people really advocate based on data-driven decision making. So let me just explain quickly what community-based indicators are, because that's where kind of our partnership came together. Um, Community-based indicators have been around for a while, uh, but the point of them are to keep track of trends at a small and local scale. And they are there to provide general insight into the overall direction of community. And so when Urban Waters is aiming to um, you know, assist distressed communities, our indicators really kind of help everybody understand what that is. What do we mean by distressed, and what are the implications of the work that are going on? The great thing about these indicators is it's incredibly uh, resident-driven. Um, when Binia was created back in 2000, there were so many people that came together and said, you know, we really want to know our crime rate or our median house sales price or how long it takes to sell a property in my neighborhood. Um, these are things that everybody in any neighborhood would want to know. And so all of our indicators are what are, uh, are technically calculated, so it's very rigorous methodology, but they're meant to be for kind of the layman. Uh, they're meant to be uh, recognizable and um, understandable by anybody. So we pull data from all kinds of city agencies. Now going back you know, to the early 2000s before uh, kind of the open data movement where governments are now putting their data up on open portals for anybody to access. This used to be a very difficult thing, <laughs> trying to get data from different city agencies. Um, but we get data from the housing department, like somebody who might pull a permit to upgrade their kitchen is actually a sign of investment in a neighborhood. And so we pull permit data. We unfortunately pull violation data A vacant and abandoned house is a violation here in the city of Baltimore, and particularly when it gets so bad that it becomes uninhabitable. So we have all that information. We have police data, crime data, uh, vital statistics. Um, and when you pull all these things together, these are how neighborhoods have to react to each one of these individual city agencies. We have an internal database. Um, here that pulls all this together and integrates it. And that was the expertise, I think, that we were able to bring to the mapping project. Because that's what it would be involved, is integrating lots of different organizations' data. And we had already been doing this now for 10 years with huge amounts of data from different city agencies. So that's the expertise that we brought. And I wanted to focus in on kind of administrative data uh, and where our next steps were in the mapping process. So we take all this data and we integrate it and create community-based indicators for communities in Baltimore. There are 55 communities. These were established back in 2000 and slightly upgraded in 2010 um, based on census tract information. And we put together roughly 100 indicators for each one of the 55 communities. And you can think of it as kind of a continuous monitoring of neighborhoods. We call it like a stethoscope. We're constantly monitoring the health of neighborhoods, and we produce annually the vital signs report. 
the report is not only something that you can download and read, but all of the data, um, more than 100 indicators for all 55 neighborhoods going back now 15 years, um, is available for people to download, for people to use in all kinds of different ways um, for advocating for better quality of life in their neighborhood. So when the Baltimore Water, uh, Urban Waters Partnership came to Baltimore, you know, we already had a decade of this kind of work under our belt. Um, and we're moving towards getting um, more specific data for communities around water quality. So just to give you an example of the types of things you can do with every indicator on um, our website, and you're welcome to um, look at our website anytime. You can take any one of the indicators. One of them is, for example, properties that are vacant and abandoned. And the map that Mike had shown earlier um, has kind of the points of where they are. Here is kind of the magnitude of what that represents. So for places um, you know, on the east and west side of Baltimore, we're talking between 20 to 33, 34% of all properties are vacant and abandoned, which is a pretty high magnitude of a problem. Um, ownership is a big problem with these vacant and abandoned houses. The next map shows of those that are vacant, which ones are owned by the city of Baltimore. And you can see that some neighborhoods, it's very little. And when the city does not own the property, it's very difficult to figure out who um, is responsible for that vacant uh, property. So just to kind of reiterate why um, urban waters are so important to communities, if you think about the 14,000 vacant lots and the 16,000 vacant um, houses, uh, it's mostly a problem, not only the ownership issue that I just mentioned, but also because there's no pattern to where they are. Um, rapid population decline is not something that cities plan for. Uh, it happens very spontaneously and kind of very erratically. And so a vacant house um, can happen anywhere, but they tend to happen in places that are uh, economically and socially distressed. And even in those types of neighborhoods, um, once you start abandonment, it kind of spirals out of control to the point where you get to 34% vacant and abandoned property. So the first thing is obviously timely and accurate in inventory of where they are, which uh, Morgan just talked about, but also what people are doing on these properties. Um, lots of people are engaged in every neighborhood and hard to keep track of kind of what's going on in a neighborhood. So that's why uh, our engagement with the Baltimore Green Registry was timely. I think we, th the key there is that we had mutual interests in um, achieving this. Not only did we want to get urban waters and type information to our communities, I think conversely, all of the communities that had been watching our data uh, would have been useful to the urban waters partnership. So that mutuality, I think, is uh, important for for, to stress. So again, we were interested in getting more water quality data to communities, and uh, Urban Waters Partnership here in Baltimore was interested in you know, really getting a good inventory of what's going on. So the um, Green Pattern Registry, I should mention, was um, we started getting engaged through a long-term cooperative uh, agreement with the USDA Forestry Division to think through the mapping aspects of the Baltimore Urban Waters Partnership. Um, we are hosted at the University of Baltimore, so we were able to do that as a um, higher educational institution. So of the eight patterns, you can imagine at the community level, any one of these eight patterns could be happening um, anywhere in a neighborhood, any vacant and abandoned property lot. And so, or conversely, almost all eight of them could be happening in one neighborhood. So knowing what's going on and managing that process for neighborhoods is what the mapping project is meant to do. I want to talk a little bit about the technical aspects of, um, kind of what we're attempting to do, because I think that may be lost in the mapping translation. I mentioned before that we focus typically on administrative data sets which even though that might be a very large data set, like how many people called 911 in a given year might have a million records. But for us, 
it didn't matter the size, uh, it was one source. We knew to go to one source to get all 911 calls. In the case of community managed open space, we don't have a department of community managed open spaces. And so in order to assemble a good um, inventory of what's really going on, we actually needed to work with the nonprofit organizations that may have um, been keeping track of where these properties are. So we, for that one particular pattern, we had to put together five different sources of data, nine total data sets. And for example, stormwater management, right now we have the vast majority from the Department of Public Works, but we're currently working with other NGOs that have uh, stormwater management projects. So each individual pattern in the pattern book requires data integration across different nonprofit organizations. And I think, you know, take each eight times however many organizations we need to collect data from, um, that's where our expertise kind of comes in, where we can take people's information and, and integrate it. And also the value of connecting it to the vital signs report will truly show, you know, the quality of life in the neighborhoods where this work is going on. So we pulled together individual organizations' data. They come in all shapes and sizes. And if you are with a nonprofit organization, you are probably thinking about your own data sets, <laughs> what they might look like. Some people, it's an Excel spreadsheet. Some people, it's an actual database. For some people, it's potentially a Word document. <laughs> and for some, it may not even be electronic. Uh, so just we take organizational data as it is, no matter what the format, um, and we work on our end to actually try and integrate it and then provide some technical assistance back on you know, how they might want to better uh, monitor their own data and keep certain fields that would be useful for the mapping project. So these are the kinds of things that we worked with each organization to figure out. Um, is there any private information that we would need to set up a data sharing agreement for? What, what format is their data in? Is it even electronic? Does your organization need technical assistance? Is there information um, that even if we get it should continue to remain pr private and not be mapped out on the website? We also wanted to make sure that the map um, had the utility that the organizations themselves needed. So what were people looking for? Search for proximity. Um, is it one project with multiple parcels, for example? And then obviously looking at what the context is um, on the ground in terms of using the vital science indicators. We spent a lot of time thinking through mapping platforms. Um, even though we have been engaged in mapping for a long time, um, we knew that we wanted to get to a point where community-based organizations or actually anybody would add information to the site. So even though we're collecting all this information from organizations, we wanted to make sure that there was some way to engage people on the ground. So things like, uh, and this is also a, a direction that Binya wanted to head in anyway, we wanted to allow people to, for example, add a site that we might not have even on these integrated databases. It could be that somebody's working on a community managed open space that isn't in our database right now we would love to engage people by adding to the map. Um, for sites that are on the map, we would love to keep a photo of what's going on because it certainly does you know, tell a, a bigger picture of what people are working on, and it is a way to engage people. So here is uh, what the map looks like. You're looking at um, the colored aspects of the map are the neighborhoods. and you can uh, see in this particular case a map of um, community managed, uh, sorry, uh, I think this is um, income levels. And you can see the darker the scale, the higher the income, the lighter the scale, the, the lower the income. And on top of it, you can see where, for example, stormwater management projects are going on in this particular case. And that is what you can click on any one of the neighborhoods, and you can click on any one of the sites and get more information about not only the site, but the context and the neighborhood that it's in. So here are some quick features. 
you can hear it shows that you can click on a neighborhood, in this case the Orangeville East Highland Town, and see kind of the percentage of um, uh, you know, people living in, in poverty. Uh, on top of it are the dots of where we have, in this case, community managed open spaces. And then on the left hand side, we're trying to get make sure that each site has a picture so you can actually see what's going on on the ground. And then on any point, you should be able to click on it and uh, see a picture, see any other information we might have on it, what type it is, who you might want to contact for more information, and um, where you can you know, see other things going on in, in close proximity. So we're um, on the way to building out more patterns. We're working on trees next. Um, we want to focus, our focus is always on making sure that our acquisition and integration protocols are clear, because if we don't make this sustainable and timely and up to date, it will not be a useful uh, map. Uh, and then we're also trying to improve our user interface on the front end and ultimately try to get to community engagement, get people involved in the map, and looking at where they might want to take on a project in the future. And then as uh, Morgan and uh, Mike suggested, in the, uh, the ultimate goal is to make sure that all of this provides input into an overall green vision for Baltimore. So uh, you're more than welcome to visit our website. The specific site for this project is called water.bniajfi.org. And our overall website is bniajfi.org. Ask any questions in the future. Great. All right. Seema, Seema if I yeah, may add, I, I think a, a, a feature, a neat feature that you have is that um, there's something called Baltimore Data Day that, that you guys run every year. And it, during that day and at other times, there's opportunities for you to provide not only engagement but training on, on how to use the site, how to integrate. Uh, and connect to the other data resources that you have. So it goes beyond just the creation of the uh, of the website. You really embraced all the social aspects of getting getting data in and getting information used. And and I think that's a really neat aspect of of what you're doing with the Green Pattern Registry. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Morgan. Thanks for reminding me of that. Um, in general. Uh, we believe, or part of our mission, is that data is great, but if people aren't using it, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and so you have to get data in the hands of the right people at the right time. And that's why timely, updatable, monitorable data is at the core of our mission. A couple of questions, Seema. Um, Carol, how long do you keep the data on the map, and how do you monitor, um, how do you monitor changes or outdated information? We update. And then there's another one from Jill. Let me just jump in. Is BNIA mapping the results of stormwater management as a result of uh, this green patterns being implemented? So we absolutely think through an update cycle for all of our data sets because you know information changes across everything. Um, so with each organization, uh, we're thinking about a one-year update cycle. Um, that's when we bring in. For example, I'll just stick to community managed open spaces. We have five different organizations. We bring them in, um, ideally every year, take a look at the, whatever their data is, match it to what we already have, add any new sites, subtract any sites that might not may no longer be a community managed open space, um, and that will tend to get the lion's share of the projects that are truly on the ground. Just to give an example, when we took the five organizations' data, if you just added up all of their rows of information, it was 2,000 properties. But only when we mapped them out did we realize that there was a lot of duplication across organizations. And so we kind of took the intersection of all of them and got to 900 sites, which I think is incredibly powerful that um, you know the organizations don't have to duplicate effort because they know where the sites are and who's kind of got their eye on them. Um, but eventually, we would like to get to a space where you know um, communities and people engage and add sites that we might none of the, the organizations might not even know about. 
Um, with respect to stormwater, that's a little bit different than community managed open spaces. And we are specifically working with the Department of Public Works to make sure that permitted and non-permitted sites can get up on the site. The, One thing the, I'd like to add, Diana, excuse me a second. Um, if, if it's pretty impressive, the work that BNIA has done on this project. Um, and it might seem a little bit overwhelming if you don't have a, an organization like that that's playing that role of, of managing and collecting all this data. But I, I do want to go back to Seema's first point. There are 36 cities that are partners in this uh, neighborhood indicators partnership, including a lot of cities that are represented on this call, Atlanta, Detroit, New Orleans. So please do take a look at, um, at that organization and see if your city is uh, one of those partners. And then also the Urban Institute, who coordinates this partnership, has an application process. If this is something that might be of interest, and obviously it's bringing together not just groups that are interested in, in you know, water issues and, and uh, revitalization, but all kinds of community re revitalization issues, um, it might be something to bring up. You know, it, can you work in coordination to encourage the city to become a partner uh, and, and find a way to do, serve this role? Um, Mike, did you have something else to add? We've got just like five minutes before the top of the hour, and then we have some other um, other questions there from Fatima. Uh, it was Morgan. I was going to answer uh, a question about who does the who who. It's it's a separate group who who looks at the effectiveness of say the stormwater management uh, installation. So that would be the Baltimore City Department of Public Works. And then we also have something called the Baltimore Ecosystem Study, which is a long-term uh, research program that's funded through the National Science Foundation, has other partners like USGS and, and, and uh, the Forest Service. And, and if you go back to that framework that I talked about, where we have the pattern book and we have local projects, we also had models and monitoring. It's the models and monitoring group who would be that, doing that kind of monitoring. Um, and, and the mapping is connected. Um, you're, you're noting the connections, but mapping doesn't have monitoring responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And a question from Fatima. Um, can the methodology for creating the quality of life indicators be shared? Seema, that's probably for you. Oh, absolutely. And um, there is tons of information on the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership website on what indicators every site collects. And um, we specifically work as an indicator network to uh, learn about what kind of indicators are going on in other neighborhoods that we should bring to Baltimore, and vice versa. So it's uh, neighborhoodindicators.org. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, um, Mike, I see you've been very busy <laughs> answering questions here on the left side of the screen. Thank you for doing that. I don't know if there's anything that you want to highlight from this. Uh, no, just to say thanks, everybody, for the opportunity to share. As Morgan said, we, we think that uh, the work that the field station is doing and the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance is doing and the Polar Office of Sustainability is doing is not only very helpful to Baltimore, but it, that it's very transferable and replicable. So we hope you can see yourself in it in some way and that it may be helpful to you and your partners as you engage with your Urban Waters Partnership. Great. Yeah, this is Deanna. I want to encourage if, if um, this really is for, for those of us who have been doing work on green infrastructure, this is really the the 201 and the 301 helping um, move beyond single projects, single pilot sites, to really working at a bigger scale to think about what's possible. I think I saw the number you shared there, Mike, was 242 stormwater management project sites, which is pretty incredible. So helping, um, you know, be helping us all be more strategic in our own cities about how we, you know, in install some of those practices. So if you've been inspired or, or think there's, you know, something that you can take home. Uh, from this project um, or would like to kind of brainstorm with others uh, how you might move this forward. Uh, one of the things that we provide a service through the learning, Urban Waters Learning Network, is just 
you know, a peer call, a forum to talk to others who are interested in the same topic, whatever that might be. So if there's enough interest to get, you know, and if it's 5 or 10 or 15 people, as far as I'm concerned, that's the right number of people um, who want to talk to each other. Maybe we can tap into Mike or, or Seema or, or Morgan to help us think through, you know, and answer any questions as you sort of, you know, uh, digest all this information. So I want to make sure you, you know that, and, and please let me know if, uh, if, if you would be interested in doing that. I'd love to hear from you. So without um, further ado, I just want to thank our three presenters. Um, it has been a very exciting project. Um, I've, you know, since I first heard of it, I thought it was a uh, great uh, inspiration and, and something to, for uh, the rest of us to sort of keep track on and follow. And as you, you move into the implementation phase, um, we'd love to hear some updates. We can share some through the Urban Waters Learning Network. Um, I see uh, Mike Galvin has shared his email information. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and I'll email everybody who registered for this webinar with their uh, PDFs of their presentations, as well as the link to the recording. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Thanks, Mike. Really appreciate you taking the time and all of you who took an hour out of your afternoon to join us today. As we close up the, the meeting room, I, if I can just beg your, um, you to humor us with some feedback on how this webinar went for you and if there's other, um, any feedback you have for ourselves or our presenters and any, um, any suggestions you have for other topics you'd like us to cover. That would be wonderful. So thank you, everybody. I'll go ahead and close the meeting. Bye-bye.